Good morning. You're listening to 91.9 FM, WDRT in Viroqua, Wisconsin. This is the Heart of Wellness Show with host Drs. Paul and Paula Grenier. Before we move forward with today's guest, as host of this show, we would like to apologize for the inappropriate comments made last week on the show. These are stressful times. Emotions got the best of us, and for this we are sorry for offending anyone in the community. We want to state that our personal comments are not a reflection of WDRT's position on the current state of affairs. We hope you all choose to continue to support WDRT and the good it brings to our community. So I'd like to introduce today our guest, Allison McDowell. She is a mother and an independent researcher in the city of Philadelphia, and she's joining us today. We really appreciate that. Allison, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. This might be the first time ever in 500 shows <laughs> that I might be silenced because I have <laughs> read a bit of her blogs and looked her information up, and it blows my mind. So let's just <laughs> see what happens and see where this goes. Paul, you're, you're a man of many questions. I've known you for 35 well, years. I highly doubt you'd be rendered silent. I'm well, assuming you have lots of questions. <laughs> maybe that's all I got today is questions, which is not always the case. Right. Um, Allison, a great place to start is maybe giving our listeners a little backdrop of who you are and how you got to this place. And um, yeah, we'll just launch into your your your, your uh, researching that you do in Philadelphia and explore the topic. Sure. Um, so I, I got my start, again, I'm, I'm a mom. Uh, our, our child went through the Philadelphia public school system for 13 years. They're now in their second year in college. But, um, you know, Philadelphia is a, is a large um, a city, uh, a city that's, you know, very poor, uh, um, also a black city predominantly, was really the focus of a lot of interventions in the education system and a lot of efforts to privatize the schools. And I was really just a regular mom sort of helping out in the schools. I have a half-time job, which gives me some time to do another job, um, which is, you know, I, I was involved in a regular way. But in 2013, um, they closed 23 of our schools and um, laid off 3,000 teachers and threw everything in upheaval and at the time tried to use sort of this shock doctrine event to implement a lot of changes around um, uh, school report cards and applying to schools and, and privatizing efforts. And so I started, you know, really becoming more engaged around education policy at that time and um, realizing, it, you know, initially thinking that it was because people didn't understand the harm that was being caused. Um, but then rapidly sort of figured out that actually the, the causing of the harm was the whole point and that the people who are managing these systems were often um, not based in our local community and that our schools were being used um, to create profit centers that were largely linked also into educational technology and data analytics, so treating children as, as data points. and. So I was, I was working around school closures, but eventually sort of was looking to standardize testing and the ways in which that was both um, causing harm to the curriculum and the standardization of the curriculum um, and the surveillance in these educational technologies. Um, and so I was, I was coordinated, like I worked with the opt-out movement for quite some time um, and then eventually realized that the shift was that they were going to ultimately get rid of these end-of-year tests that were very harmful and implement just all the time data analytics through um, online education, right? And and this was all doing, you know, having no idea that pandemic was sort of looming out there on the horizon, that there was going to be this trigger event that would then push everybody into predominantly virtual schooling mm -hmm. indefinitely, um, which is very overwhelming. But so I did that for about three or four years and was not really able to make more progress because for the most part the teachers were very um, overwhelmed, they were focused on other things and they were not able to sort of see the broader issues. And then what I realized was that the, the idea of um, turning life um, into a commodity for data, both for um, tracking humans as um, commodities for financial markets as well as for signals intelligence right, for social engineering purposes, was not really limited in any way just to the education sphere. And then in many ways, um, it was about poverty management. And so I, I shifted my emphasis and I was working locally with groups that were working outside of what I call the nonprofit industrial complex, um, who were not taking foundation grants and government money and really doing on the ground sort of mutual aid work. Um, and Philadelphia is also a center of the heroin epidemic. Um, so there were lots of issues around 
the opioid crisis and impact investing. This is we'll talk about this a little bit later, but using individual data as an impact commodity. So it wasn't just education; it was also healthcare. And then ultimately um, connecting with people who are working on issues of affordable housing. So it was also segueing into housing. And it's important to understand that we are the home of Comcast. Um, Com- and the Did you say Comcast? That are sort of rolling out are connected with the telecommunications mm. companies. Comcast and Comcast. Verizon have major presences in Philadelphia. And we are a smart city. And what a smart city is, is a city that is increasingly um, collecting data on how people um, interact both digitally with their government and also within the physical environment. And that mm-hmm. can manifest in terms of infrastructure like smart trash cans and some smart street lights and some, you know, various smart technologies. Um, but so I have all of these pieces where of looking at the way in which people are being managed um, in ways, and I can talk a little bit more about this new financial market that's being set up, but to gather data that allows um, global finance to make money off of betting on people's lives. Hmm. Betting well, off of people's lives? Yeah, that, right. That's sort of my start with sort of education, poverty, um, smart city infrastructure, and then pandemic. And what okay. I feel like at this point is that um, COVID is the trigger event for a larger program that's coming out of Davos and the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, that's gotten a lot of um, press lately, I would encourage people to look up the hashtag Great Reset. Justin Trudeau was speaking of it, and so it actually went viral this week, Great Reset, um, in which we're going to now really remake the world for sort of glo- transnational global capital, largely financial and technology and defense interests um, under these lockdown situations. That way it's, it's, a, it's a global shock doctrine event, <laughs> um, and we're going to sort of reset everything. Um, but the control mechanism within that is largely a biosecurity state, right? So um, the tracking and the management of the population will be done through um, linked technologies to our health status. Wow. So, so that last part, link, link, meaning like, is, would that be the chip world that you have? You have... Um, electronics within our own body or on our body or is the phone that we carry around is that significant enough to to track that is that what I'm hearing there well I would encourage people to look up um, the World Wide Web Consortium has been working with many diverse interests for over a decade on something called digital identity or self-sovereign identity and so for the impact markets to work, they want interoperable data. So data that is relational to each other, that is not separate, that your education information bumps up against your health information, against your voting information, against all of these things. That is what is the most valuable to them. And so they've they've set their sights on creating um, a way to globally scale an interoperable identity system. And that you can look up ID2020. That's one of the, the efforts that's backed by Gates. Um, but this idea of once you have a digital identity, if it's linked to your biometrics, um, you don't actually have to have um, a chip. I think a lot of people that's used to sort of write people off to say, oh, no, that's conspiracy theory. They're not actually putting a chip in you. It would never work. Actually, all they really need is a QR code. Because once they've set up this biometric digital identity and it links your biometric, say your retinal scan or a thumbprint, um, India was sort of the early pilot with Gates backing of Aadhaar, a biometric identity that's tied to digital currency, Um, you don't need a chip. I mean, it may certainly eventually get to that, but I think that they have to make that more normal. I mean, the technology exists that they could do it. Um, And clearly in Sweden, people are getting chips not necessarily for biosecurity reasons, but for reasons of access or many or things like that. That's definitely already the technology exists, but they would like us to discount it. Um, in the city of Austin, a program has, is underway with um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropies, and it's called MyPass. And essentially, they're tracking unhoused people um, linked to their medical status. Not COVID, this happened pre-COVID, but tracking their medical records with a QR code tied to a digital identity. And that's part of ID2020. Austin is one of the pilot programs for that. What, what so was the name of the foundation? As simple as you don't even, you're an unhoused person, you don't even have a phone, but they'll give you a laminated card with a QR code. It could be very low tech. Hmm. And it could be super high tech, right? <laughs> like right. it could be super high tech. Eventually they can maybe have injectable nanotechnology that tracks 
right? But but I don't think they they'll start there. And I think sometimes when people we initially talk about things, it's used to discount the concern. Okay. Um, I just want to step back there. So in Austin, you said it's a, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the yes. the program is and called Michael M- Bloomberg. And Michael Bloomberg. Yes, Bloomberg Philanthropies. A oh, Bloomberg. Okay. And then it was called My Path. Was the program right? Pass. My Path. P A S S. Pass. Oh, my pass. Together, like okay. M Y, and then capital P A S S. Oh, got it. Okay. So, okay. so, so let's just sum this up here that we're just talking about. A good chunk of the world would be excited about this. This is like, even though they might not even understand it, I might have understood thirty percent of it, but I kind of can get like, oh, this is all becoming a digital world, and if you can't keep up to that, your your it's it's life is not going to be that easy for you. So so in this process, and they're so they're selling it as, oh my God, your kids are going to get this great education with this awesome uh, uh, AI. Uh, um, uh, ability and the ability of these computers to teach them so much better. And it, am I hearing that kind of in, in, in a summary way that, 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 oh, it's, it's sold as this package of advancement. Uh, this is advancing human uh, um, experience on this planet. I have, and Paula, have been talking about the dangers of, of video way back uh, in 25, 30 years ago and 35 years ago talking about how this is affecting our nervous systems as chiropractors. We really see that happening, that people are coming in with a much bigger buzz in their body. Their nervous systems are completely overloaded. They're sitting in front of a... We're sitting way more than we did in 1980. So in our lifetimes, we have seen quite a transition. I never had a TV until I was 12 years old in, in our house, 10, 12 years old. So that shift to like, whoa... You know, are we going down a path that we won't even recognize what the natural human looks like uh, um, 20, 30 years from now? Am, am I, and I would say, I would like, whoa, is this a good thing? I ask the question, is this a good thing? Is this good for our children's brains? Does this help us? I'm not quite, I'm definitely not up on what happened to the public schools and pri- what privatizing means. But I'm assuming, and now we're all sitting at home in front of a computer, learning in that form. And I know that's terrible for anybody under the age of nine, but really uh, any young being that you got to you got to have a better different or different type of education to really expand in a broad way. Where do you go with that, so, huh? <laughs> so, well, I would say, so th- this is an important, these are really big concepts for people, mm-hmm. and I just want to sort of lay out that the Great Reset and the World Economic Forum, which are sort of the most powerful um, corporate interests in the world and financial interests in the world, um, have laid out and they have decided that what we are going to undergo, what they call a fourth industrial revolution. Okay, so like none of us got picked to be born <laughs> this attempted fourth industrial revolution, but we need to understand what what the intention of this is and the, these very powerful actors. And as we know, um, there was great um, wealth inequality going into pandemic, and the people who have made tremendous money are largely these sort of finance and technology interests um, since that. So that wealth and power has become further concentrated, and many people are being dispossessed out of their um, ability to work, you know, in their careers or limited or constrained or fully eliminated from their work due to the lockdowns and will be forced to reskill in this fourth industrial revolution. Hmm. And what Davos and the World Economic Forum and this gentleman, his name is Klaus Schwab, um, what characterizes the fourth industrial revolution are things like um, automation, um, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, the Internet of Things, which is the sensors, you know, like you're living in an augmented reality world where every bit of the world has a digital overlay of information and tracking. Um, synthetic biology, which is actually bioengineering through biological means, but also through nanotechnology, even nanorobotics. <laughs> um, and, and um, you know, my concern is that Moderna, which is one of the, the vaccinations that's being advanced, is actually... Um, a bioengineering product 
you know, by a company that's never actually brought an FDA approved product to market. Um, that's an, the M- mRNA approach. They actually on their website frame it as the software of life. So they're, they're framing it very much as a bioengineering program, which in some ways, um, you know, I'm sure that people with very dire um, medical needs that would not be addressed in other ways might avail themselves of synthetic biological work, you know, products. But to do that at a population level, I, I think I would expect many people of ethics would be questioning um, the nature of that to, to allow that to advance, um, especially given that there is a you know, full immunity for the companies of any harm that is caused and that no one really knows what the implications of this, this population level mRNA um, injectables um, might be. So, um, so synthetic biology is a big piece of this, and um, many of the individuals connected with the World Economic Forum, um, and we know through Elon Musk and other individuals, is that they are imagining human-computer interfaces that people will merge with machines. Wow. And whether that means um, through virtual reality or through injectable technologies like these nanorobotics. Um, becoming cyborgs, you know, and I had to tell my 19-year-old, like, I'm really concerned about cyborgs, and they're thinking somebody with, like, a mechanical arm. And I'm like, no, like, it could be nanotechnology. You might, it's, it might not even change the way you look, right? Mm-hmm. But is technology, um, you know, it, it, interacting with, with how we interact with the world? And there are serious questions about um, if people are, that can be forced against someone's will. And I think that's what we're looking at right now in New York State is this option of um, Governor Cuomo and the New York State Bar are advancing um, to have forced vaccination of every person in New York State um, if they deem that necessary. And then the, there, there are very serious questions about, I have, about the nature of forced medical procedures um, with these untested technologies. Um, so there is very much a connection between humans and digital spaces. Um, some of these individuals, there's actually, you can look up transhumanism, um, which is this idea of uploading oneself, like, to the cloud, your consciousness, and actually, like, en- electrical engineering consciousness. Um, and one of the, the key organizations that's working to sort of transform um, education is called Global Education Futures, Global Education Futures Forum. And there's an individual, his name is Pavel Luksha, um, P-A-V-E-L, L-U-K-S-H-A, and he's out of um, uh, Skolkovo, uh, which is sort of like the Silicon Valley of Russia, and he's a noted transhumanist, and they are looking to, to remake education um, around that model, and actually um, he's very influential in sort of world skill uh, tracking and reskilling people. So then the question is, um, you know, moving forward, if you have automation, if you have a push for robots and algorithms to replace not only industrial manufacturing labor, but also um, uh, knowledge work and um, a, a social care, <laughs> um, you know, that having your child have a teacher who's a robot, <laughs> um, you know, mm. or having your elderly parents being watched by a tablet, um, these digital systems, many more people will be displaced from work so that they will mm. be re-skilled to do the jobs that those who have all the power want to have done, which is largely to code this virtual world because it actually has to be constructed in code. So that's the push for STEM education. Um, and then also to run this sort of synthetic biology program. And um, even in the state of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, who's the governor of New Jersey, just issued a, a new financial product um, that they would reskill displaced workers um, from the lockdowns. Um, and their choices were essentially um, coding, like coding boot camps, um, working in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and smart energy. So they're not going to let you just do any job that you want. They really are going to ensure that people who are displaced are doing the work that will advance the agenda of those who have all the power. Oh, okay. And that's very prospect. Yeah, right, right. Jump in. Well, and yeah. the synthetic biology is a big piece of that. Yes. Well, there's no synthetic biology here at WDRT. <laughs> it's nothing but human-run <laughs> programs and with a little technology to help us get it to your home for so sure. thank you for tuning in to the heart of wellness <laughs> where we are alive humans on the other end of this with no nanobots in us so far as far as we know maybe a few chemicals 
brought by a few <laughs> local good breweries, but <laughs> other than so that, pretty humanist. Right, and if you're just joining us, today's guest is Allison McDowell. Um, how you can reach Allison, she has a website called wrenchinthegears.com, just as it sounds, W-R-E-N-C-H, in the gears, G-E-A-R-S. I like that, wrench in the gears. Sounds like you're throwing a wrench in some gears here. And uh, Allison is a, is, a, is a mom, and she's an independent researcher, and she resides in Philadelphia. And ooh, from what I've heard so far, you are doing a lot of research, Allison. <laughs> I'm impressed by that. I appreciate your um, commitment to learning and growing and, you know, staying with the time, shall I say. You know, because some of us are out there, many of us are out there just, you know, the old saying, chopping wood, carrying water, right? Like, you know, just doing my life feeding, putting food on the table, you know, doing some things like that. And in the meantime, it sounds like there's other folks doing some other work out there. Um, some names you've mentioned, like the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset, hashtag Great Reset. These are things that might be new to our listeners, um, you know, and new to me as I'm researching it with you um, when I heard I was going to talk with you. So this is great. This is great to bring new ideas to people and let people's brains think about some different stuff, right? Because on a really simple level, I would ask, where are all the teachers going to go? You know, they're going to go to boot camp. I mean, that, that, <laughs> wouldn't that be a potential possibility that the um, um, I would guess that's in the works is virtual school, or at least if you're going to school, you're going to be on a computer, which I, I haven't been in school for such a long time, and my kids didn't go to public school, so I don't know if that is their life, you know, the computer world. Well, right they, now it is, yeah, pandemic. I mean, it's pandemic, yeah, it is, yeah. But I mean, what, 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 what is your thought of the future of the education of children? Where, where is that going? Well. well, I hope that we would fight for the right of education to be a social process. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Correct. And, you know, I, I, it, it seems crazy. I mean, I know a lot of the things that I've said sound... I never thought this was what I was going to have to do. Right? <laughs> it, it sounds surreal every day. I'm like, I feel like I'm in a crazy movie. How did I go from fighting um, standardized tests to, like, cyborg synthetic biology? Wow. <laughs> you know, it wasn't where I, I had expected or really want to be, but this seems to be the story I have to tell because I think... All of us have different parts of the puzzle, and some of it is framing, because they are very successful in attempting to frame this as a wonderful world of abundance and plenty and innovation and cutting-edge technologies. Um, and so I think it behooves us to sort of look at the flip side, um, you know, but because for me, if you're someone who really um, wants to stay in the natural world, that this becomes a global digital prison. Right, And so I think, and maybe the truth lies somewhere in between, but we have to really have a very critical view about what's happening and not just listen to the to, to the hype because we know, you know, I'm, I'm visiting with my elderly parents this week and, you know, they're listening. I've, I pretty much never listen to the news. I do my own research, but I don't listen to the news and it, I, it makes me, my skin crawl. And like sometimes it's CNN and sometimes it's Fox, but I had to tell my mom, I'm like, mom, the news, they're all owned by the same six people, <laughs> I don't know, for the same end, but they have all the power. They're going to tell you on the news the things that they want to make sure that you do what they want you to do. You know, you need to step back and just look at it with a critical lens. They have different flavors of it to appeal to different people, but it's owned by this power structure. And, um, you know, I think they're, the intention is for us to get swept up in, in this and to not think critically. And so, you know, I, I welcome people to sort of critique or offer alternative views or bring their information because I think learning should be a dynamic process. And I would say I, I actually had a run-in with um, Naomi Klein a couple weeks ago that, that sort of circulated. I was asked to be on a panel at Rutgers, and she was pushing back about the Great Reset, you know, which is ironic since she wrote The Shock Doctrine. Um, you know, and she was not at all interested in having people actually go to the primary sources and look at things for themselves. She was trying to shelter her students against fake news. And I'm like, no, you know, you don't have to trust me. Nobody should trust me. People, I'm going to give you some information, and I'm going to tell you it's really, really important and that you should go look it up and see for yourself. And so that's the kind of education I think we most need because what they would like us to uh, acquiesce to is that an AI algorithm 
will create a feedback loop um, by monitoring children through their devices, including their biometrics and their pulse rates and their emotions. People don't realize that the cameras on these devices can collect all of that data, right? And so we're actually training artificial intelligence as we're using these digital devices. And so these crappy Chromebooks that, you know, they're shoving in the kids' hands, we're teaching the AI. We're bringing about the singularity by giving them our humanity. And, um, you know, we people need to understand the broader context. So I, I've been really devastated, honestly, by the response of the teachers to what's happening. Um, you know, I've mostly moved on from education because they, and, and maybe that's the thing, like maybe compulsory education has been about creating um, human capital to feed into the industry. So maybe they're really just doing what they've always done and I just woke up to realize that that was a really terrible thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I came into this fighting for neighborhood schools and now I'm like, oh my gosh, where are the underground classrooms that are disconnected and the people, you know, who can learn in the woods and like, it's a very different place than I am than where I started. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if that just means I changed or that the system has changed. Um, but I think the right of children to learn in relationship face-to-face with peers and in, in guidance is very vitally important. And, and the other piece of education that I, I think people are not going to be aware of is that we're shifting now from device-based education to wearable technology mm. and implantable technologies. And um, so that many... Um, advances in education that will be presented as wonderful alternatives to this really terrible online education will be project-based learning. Um, But what they don't tell you is that they've already piloted in Montessori schools flipping Internet of Things sensors and the kids felt slippers so they can track them around the classroom. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. They won't talk about the brainwave monitoring headbands. Yeah, back up on that. You said they've already slipped that into some classrooms? Or as as like a pilot project or something? Yeah, there's actually, sorry, I have to just go. Sorry about that. Um, there is a, um, a, a Montessori franchise in the Boston area, and it was a, a parent who was connected to MIT. Mm. And they, have, they said, we really care about the whole child, and we care about their social relationships. And so what, we, what, we're, what we, they agreed to do was to actually put sensors in the children's felt slippers because that was part of what they did at the school was they had these felt slippers and then they would track the kids. You know, who did they play with? Were they in the black corner? Were they in the book corner? Were they with the teacher? How much time? Because they cared, right? And so in that way, the children just in living their lives socially in an educational setting, in a rather posh educational setting, because this is a Montessori, you know, a high-end Montessori school, Mm -hmm. that they become data commodities and profiled. Hmm. And so most people who are thinking education, a lot of it is they create the problem in such a way that they drive you to the solution they want. And so they've standardized the curriculum, they've put everybody on these devices, they know it's horrible, and then the way out will be project-based learning, but you have to wear a smart uniform, right, or smart shoes. And you have to have a, you know, your Fitbit to track your health status (laughs) while you're doing your project so that we can, you know, track all of this. And oh. additionally, there's an element with virtual reality headsets that um, that some of the skills training actually, it's almost like gaming, and then you, you track your points up into like an online locker, and this is through something called XAPI technology. So the, these um, virtual reality headsets that they were bringing into classrooms is these cool field trips, um, which have, have terrible... Um, health consequences, you're not supposed to use those for people under age 13 because it messes up your vestibular and it can cause a lot of eye damage. Um, you know, they teach teachers that it's cool and fun and they get them to be the ambassadors for these nifty gimmicks. But in reality, the plan will be kids go into virtual reality to learn how to um, do their work-based projects. And, and that's another element of globalization is that there's a shift in this fourth industrial revolution to what's called telepresence labor. If you imagine, um, like it started out with drones, right? Like the militarized drones, that you were operating a drone from a distance. But they're working so you would have virtual reality or augmented reality on your you know, headsets and haptic controls on your hands that you could operate a factory halfway around the world. 
and that's something that Ericsson in Sweden is working on, is these advanced manufacturing so that they will put, you know, these factories that are, you know, so expensive in some remote location that is like, you know, I guess, best secured against environmental catastrophe or social unrest. But there won't be many people in the factory. There'll just be a few actual real people, and then everyone else will just compete for jobs running the thing and pushing the button, you know, with through haptics. And it's crazy to say that this is what the world is coming, but they've that's what they've said, you know, that this is globalization 4.0 and power present flavor, and that once they can standardize education around the globe and virtualize it, they can compete for the bottom dollar you know, for every little micro task. And they would never want you to know how to run the machine. They just want you to know to push the button. Shoof. Okay, so, you know, here's one of those questions. You know, do you ever see the, um, those uh, fireside comic strips way back? Back when people yeah. draw little things in the comics, right? Animals could talk and things. There was one uh, comic one time where it showed this person and he had a desk and there was like 20 phones in front of him and he was answering the, all these phones and someone walked in the room and said, so you're the they they've been talking about. <laughs> so, because I keep hearing say, well, they want to do this and they, you know, you know, they're going to do this and they want globalization. Like, who's the they? Well, I would, I would recommend everybody go to the World Economic Forum's website. Okay, okay. And they have their own YouTube channel. You can see all the people every January they all meet in Davos so it's, it's, you know, the most powerful um, companies and philanthropies and financial interests in the world. Okay. And, um, you know, they're, they're there. So I will say the, another interesting place that people can go to look and see what this lays out is, so uh, today, I, I do a lot of work. Um, I map things. I create these relationships map, relationship maps with this um, open source, so like crowdsource software called LittleSys, littlesys.org like big, big Brother, but little sis, oh, little sis. And so I enter lots of information. I can make maps, and it's almost like a mind map or an interactive bibliography. So anybody can, like, go on and look up my maps. I mean, you, just, you don't even need an account to look things up. You can just type in a, a name and see what comes up. Um, and there are database records. So today I've been adding the, like, 30 people who are connected to something called the Education Commission, which um, education is UN Sustainable Development Goal 4, health is UN Sustainable Development Goal 5. And all of this is about, um, t again, tied to sustainability. I say that in sort of air quotes, um, because what they're talking about is improving metrics, which doesn't really have anything to do with actually improving life for people or the planet, because to get the metrics they want for these pay for success finance deals, our lives and existences have to be run through digital technology. And so really we're killing the planet as we're creating the data and, and, and imprisoning ourselves um, as we create the data to serve the interests of the World Bank and the IMF. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there's, there's, you know, 30 people. If you look up the Education Commission, because um, I was following Gordon Brown, the former um, uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and that's what led me there. So I keep doing, like, I'll look at LinkedIn, and then, then it'll lead me to the next piece. But... Sorry, I'm a bit distracted. So look up the Education Commission, um, and then also look up the Commons Project, the Commons Project. And um, so right now with COVID, they're, they're piloting this um, biometric health passport at Heathrow. It's called Common Pass, and, and they, they just put it in really small, like, oh, well, you know, that's not so bad. Like, I would be willing to submit for a COVID test and have an online passport on my phone to be able to fly into London, right? If you look up the Commons Project, though, it is a joint project of the Rockefeller Foundation and the World Economic Forum. And that Common Pass is only one of three current projects. And they've said that they have like sort of unlimited numbers of other digital data analysis products that they're going to develop for the you know, civic good. Um, the other one is your access to education and employment. And then there's another one that's like real-time medical monitoring. And if you, if you look up the World Economic Forum, they have a white paper called the Internet of Bodies, the Internet of Bodies. And so they're talking about how COVID is now allowing essentially medicine to be transformed into um, a digital sphere, telemedicine, which I will say, um, you know, personally, I have huge issues with. I think tele, um, you know, I'm hearing that there's like 9 million dental appointments that are backlogged in the United Kingdom from the NHS because of COVID. Like, you never get that back. So I think mm -hmm. we're really actually negatively, very negatively impacting people's health. Um, you know, I have elderly parents. I have a father who's, like, suffering from dementia, and they're asking for Zoom meetings. You know, and I don't mm -hmm. live with my parents, right? Like, how are, how are people in their late 70s doing Zoom meetings about Alzheimer's? 
it's insanity, actually. And I, I question the ethics of anyone who's in the medical profession who's going along with this sort of care, because I think, um, you know, this common past idea, eventually they're going to bypass physicians entirely, and, and there, are, there are pushes towards bio, nanotechnology biosensors. So that actually you won't ever have to like go and get a COVID test. You'll just have nanotech report daily on your status. <laughs> and so if you understand the world as a global digital prison, um, something as when they start out saying, well, you just need this pass if you want to fly to London. That's not so bad. That's not so much to ask, right? They're not going to come out and say, by the way, the satellite system that is running the global digital prison that's on your phone and eventually in your body um, was set up by, you know, um, under Operation Paperclip by Nazi scientists. Like, they're not going wow. to tell you that part. Wow. Right? And that's, but that's where it goes. And if you have the larger understanding, then people might start to question, do we want a global biosecurity state? Right. Wow. Do we want that? A, gl- a global bio right what? Right now, before this goes further, is this the world that we are going to allow our grandchildren to live in? Well, right. th- th- this is this is like the unborn generations. Are right. Yeah. Rolling over for this, or are we going to fight it? Well, this is the conundrum. Mm-hmm. The, ma- the the majority of the people, including myself, utilize this computer that I carry around, uh, knowing its uh, effects. I got a magnetic cover for it to help me with EMF but I have chosen to be uh, not fully involved there but enough that okay I'm carrying this thing around not all the time but a good chunk of the time people are going to line up for this they, 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 to, this is exciting news so people can listen to this Program and want to get all excited. Oh, wow, I never knew about that. That's cool. I can't wait till that comes out. And so that's, I would guess, the majority of the population. And and they would also line up for that synthetic biology, first time ever uh, vaccine. I mean, you can hear that all the time. Oh, I can't wait to get in. I can't wait to get that vaccine. And it's like, wow. And I ask myself, and I and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we're, we're, we're um, but to me... That my gut starts churning, and I say to myself, "What are my grandchildren going to look like? My great grandchildren? Uh, you know, I'm really into. I really like that LASIK surgery thing. You know, they have that for the eyes. It's like takes a couple minutes. Boom! Now you got perfect vision. But I do believe that just it's like an adjustment with a laser on your lens, and it reheals, and and so you don't have something new. But they can put." a brand new lens in your eye and you can get 2020. So I like, ooh, that's a little goofy. And maybe in the future that lens will also be a computer that you can have in your eye. You know, so so you and then what can we do in the future when you start putting chips in the brain that you're not just for tracking, that's the the so called concerns like, oh, they're gonna track you, they're gonna know your all your biology and if you got a temperature and you're not going in to the doctor, they're gonna come to your door. You know, you can go really down all kinds of rabbit holes. But what about the technology that says you can be the smartest person in this in this country, in this con- in this world if we put these little chips in you. You can advance your brain by eighty percent. It's like, wow, you got millions of people lining up but, for that. So, but what I would say is, who is in charge of these technologies? Exactly. Right? Like, I'm asking the end? questions. I'm, I'm not saying I, I ask questions about that and the pharmaceutical world. You know, I don't trust them. This is all money, power driven situations. The pharmaceutical world, the uh, uh, chemical <laughs> world for, for farming, uh, you know, uh, all the educational process. The media. The media. I, I don't trust any of them. So, so, and I am really attached to the natural human. And <laughs> so, I, am I just stuck? Am I just stuck I know, in my way? Stuck? I mean, you think about it, you know, there's, there's still people alive that grew up in a one-room schoolhouse. I think in my dad. Yeah, I mean in America, there's still people who live grew up in a one room schoolhouse. Paul's father took a horse and buggy to to school in the morning, and um, you know the Amish in our community. That's how they live around us, Pennsylvania. You probably have a few of those out there, and you know there's that reality. And then the stuff that you're talking about, Allison, is like holy man, it's like right out of our sci-fi movies, right? Well, and (laughs) speaking of sci-fi, 
WDRT would seem like sci-fi to my grandfather who just died about five <laughs> years ago at 99. Right. You know, so, so that would be like, here it is, we're on WDRT and we're connecting to all these people out there around the but, world but you I can connect to WDRT. One of the things that I really want to emphasize is because a lot of this is going to be advanced on, on the, the heels of the, the reset, which is triggered by COVID, is that they will be advancing um, the Green New Deal, right, a global... Um, transformation and it will sound really good and and I, I love the environment I know the harm that's been caused by corporate interests I know that these same interests have not changed their tune right so they have essentially created and this is again out of Davos uh, the January theme was stakeholder capitalism so that the stakeholder capitalists who have all of the money are now going to create this faux fix to the problem that will allow them to continue to pollute and make more money. And so all of the devices, there is a really very serious environmental harm to the world that, that is caused um, due to the, the mining of the elements. Um, there are a lot of horrific child labor practices associated with these devices. Um, the the uh, fourth industrial revolution runs on 5G technology and the plan is 6G. The 6G technology is for robot to robot communication and the creation of digital twins. Okay. Digital twins. Um, so these technologies, um, there is the e-waste, right? These Chromebooks do certainly not last the 10 years of a textbook, you know? And so there's a tremendous amount of um, consumer culture um, and toxic waste and toxic behaviors that rides in on these things that are going to be framed as sustainable, sustainable development goals and green, right? And so that is really important for people to understand that these technologies are not actually saving the world because now we're just doing new and exciting things. We're actually poisoning the world that we live on to the point that, you know, maybe these individuals are imagining that they're going to jet off to Mars or merge their consciousness with some sort of cloud-based system and, you know, and make their plans. But for the regular folks, these systems are not sustainable. Mm. And, and I would highly recommend, there's another um, blogger, her name is Corey Morningstar out of um, Canada, and she writes at Wrong Kind of Green. And so, that, so Corey's piece, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, that are 17, two-thirds of them are poverty management. So that's the people. About a third are the environment. And so Corey had the environmental corporate culture piece, and I had the poverty management piece. But the two together, we have to understand that within the, the, the data-driven, the outcomes-driven finance piece of this is an unlocking capital to like create these data markets rely on killing the planet and wow. harming the poor who are creating the devices to kill the planet. And so that is just a really important reframing. The other thing that I would mention as a resource, um, you know, I come at this, you know, I'm sort of homeless politically at the moment because, you know, I was it lean left and those people, for whatever reason, like I don't know if the dark neural brain dust is like affecting them, they're not with me. <laughs> so, um, but Yasha Levine has a book called Surveillance Valley and it's a military history of the internet. So as we understand cloud computing, we have to understand that within power, it is a military space, and it is a space dominated primarily by, you know, very wealthy white men. Not exclusively, but primarily, right? So if we are living in the cloud, if we are living in a world that is run through the cloud of augmented reality, that is Eric Schmidt, that is Jeff Bezos, that is Mark Zuckerberg, um, that is all, you know, all of these individuals who do not have our best interests at heart. They simply don't. Shoot. So somebody would say that you're 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 carried away. You're going wild. You're you're like oh, just settle down. I've heard that so many times with my friends and people I'm chatting with. Just settle down, Paul. They're not going to do mandatory vaccines, Paul. Just relax. It's just you know, just go with it. They're not they're not going to make people go to school, you know, and get the flu shot, or you can't go to school. And they're you know, you're going to be able to travel. Don't worry. You're not going to need a common pass to be able to do that well we just saw it on um ticketmaster and live nation that you're going to have to have a pass to get in to the um in any of their programs in the future uh, or a negative covid test. or a negative covid test you know so in the last this, so many hours you know? this control of our biology uh you know and um or this control of of uh 
biological freedom. You know, are, are we going to be able to function? Are we going to have to go join the Amish community and, and just be a part of that? Or can I live a normal life if we flash forward five years? Hmm. I don't think we will unless people wake up, unless people understand the why. And, and I will say it's not easy to understand the why. And I think once you, especially in this moment that is highly partisan, right, people have been conditioned to be thinking about themselves, about picking a side and picking a team and being right, right? And nobody's thinking about Davos. Because I'm here to tell you both sides are a huge part of this problem. What is that? What is Davos? Davos? Pardon? Oh, the same thing. Davos is the World Economic Forum. Okay. Davos. Yeah, the World Economic Forum. Maybe okay. Davos. So the individuals behind this are the global billionaires. And many of them are from the Bay Area. Some of them are from China. It includes the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund. It includes the Vatican Bank. It includes EBS Bank. It's many interests. But they are global. And we didn't vote for them. And yet they are influencing the, the policies of how social, the social fabric is happening in every single country in the world right now. And nobody voted for them, right? And nobody gets to vote them out. Mm. And so we need to start mending those relationships. And I'm not saying for people to give up their values, but I'm saying understand the nature of the threat that we are under, which is the world against the billionaires and artificial intelligence, and start to get out of the media bubble and look at what is happening. And, and, and open your heart to also, I believe that probably 95% of the people in the world have good hearts. They don't want this to happen. If they understood it, if they truly understood it, they would not want this for themselves or their children. They mm -hmm. simply wouldn't because essentially it means giving up all of your free will. And whether you're coming at this from a progressive lens or a conservative lens, nobody wants to give up their free will. Right. The idea of having a direction in your life. Nobody wants that. Uh, but we have been told that those are the bad guys. Whichever side you're on, those other people are the bad guys and, and, and your peers. And that is not correct. The bad guys are the people who are running the global digital jail and who will make your grandchildren code it. Wow. And so we need to wake up to that. And that's hard because you have to be willing to maybe be wrong <laughs> about what you thought. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for people to admit they were wrong or that they were misled. It's a little embarrassing, and that's hard for people. And I get that. But it's too important now. It's not just a small thing. This is actually the biggest thing in the world right now, and people need to understand that. And um, I'm not saying for people to give up their core principles, but look at your principles and then realize that the labels that they want to apply to people – serve the billionaires and they don't serve the people. Wow. Wow. I want to remind people right now that our guest today is Allison McDowell and she's given us some things to think about. Uh, her website is wrenchinthegears.com W-R-E-N-C-H in the gears G-E-A-R-S dot -E -E com. Wrench in the gears. I like it. You're throwing a wrench in the gears. Oh, we're trying to anyway. Sounds like. Well, One and, mom at a time. <laughs> and part One of mom that, at a time. I love it. It, it is. It's, it's a um, it's a massive amount of motive or um, momentum the weight it's like you're trying to stop a train it's going you know people talk about what are the effects of potential uh, 5g and how that is affecting the world as, as it's being laid out the same time as covid right now you know people not even paying attention to it because you're getting distracted it's like oh it's just being laid out in everywhere in the world like, oh, does this you affect our brain? About 6G and digital twins. I know. I, mean, I didn't know about 6G and digital twins. <laughs> no. Yeah. And Let's talk about a digital twin. Again, people are excited <laughs> about this. Twin. Most people are so into their technologies that they, no way would they ever think that this path of advanced technology is, is bad for humans. And not even humans, just the the idea I, of all the we've done 500 shows on this on this radio program all about wellness i don't know if anything is more vital than the literally the 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 survival of the spirit within mm -hmm. the survival of the soul and right now is this takeover and again uh, it's hard to say oh boy I wouldn't mind that LASIK surgery, that that uh, the way they can do teeth now with the you know making 
false teeth with digital uh, ability. It's like, wow. Or uh, new knees getting put in, new hips. It's like, wow, their life gets put back. You know, those are... These are small things, but big things to these individuals. Mm -hmm. This is going to be very attractive to mm -hmm. people. It's it's like, oh yeah, I can get a chip in here. I can get I can get these little extra things. And I mean, the people just love whatever generation is next. Oh, bring it on, bring it on. So I think we're going to be a vulnerable population. We'll see what happens. I don't I don't know. At times, I don't have any hope because people aren't asking enough, enough questions. And out of the times, I got great hope that people start waking up and, and just going, wow, maybe all these things that we're advancing with are not necessarily good for our soul. Well, and the, the Social Dilemma documentary came out, and that seemed really an eye-opener for folks. I know, you know, just really, I don't know if you've seen that, Allison, you probably have with all your research, but it's, you know, really showing how that data mining is happening, how we are the we are being consumed. And they call you consumers. It's just so weird. Yeah. They, they, well, uh, you just don't, the, the, remember, users, they users, you they call for you. what they want. They what? They would like for you to ask to be a digital commodity, and that's what the social dilemma is about. Mm. It's about but, say, you should own your data, right? And then as soon as you own your all of your data, then you are the commodity. And it doesn't stop telemedicine, and it doesn't stop VR education, and it doesn't stop text there. You know, it doesn't stop these things. Mm -hmm. So that's, I would just caution because, um, you know, Shoshana Zuboff, she, she's a professor of Harvard Business School. <laughs> the answer, Harvard Business School is the system. Is right? the what? So that, that, that's why I would just, Harvard Business School is running all of this and Harvard Kennedy School, among others, and Stanford. It's, it's, the answer isn't coming out of Harvard Business School. Liberation is not coming out of Harvard Business School. Okay. So I would just caution that on, okay. on Zuboff. Okay. She is part of within the system, and, the, and and they would really like for you to ask to have a digital identity so you can own your data and be a brand. They want you to do and that. I, I think that is a question of spirit. I, mm. I think you're very right. And, I, you know, someone I always like to lift up as who has been a tremendous inspiration for me is John Trudell, who's a leader in the American Indian movement. And he very much understood... Um, larger systems of spirit and and i have to say when i i when this all started um even though i didn't make much headway with the teachers or other organizers around poverty um the people who stepped up and really valued what i had had to say were were two groups um holistic healers and people who had a faith practice and of all kinds, right? Like not just a Christian faith practice, but people from around the world. And, and because this is a pandemic, people from around the world found my work. And it was people who came from those worlds, which were neither of the worlds that I had spent much any time in. But it was just over and over again, it hit me that this is the answer. This is the, the struggle. And, and John Trudell, um, he, you know, what he, he talked about a predator energy. And he mm. said that it is the, the, um, our responsibility as, um, you know, to use the intelligence given to us by the Creator um, to be thinking beings. And he talked about believing versus thinking, to be actively thinking, and to, to put our, our minds and bodies up against the machine of what he called tech no logic, T E C H and dash no dash logic, technologic, as many have done before. And so for me, when, when things feel hopeless, is that no, actually, you know, these, these struggles have happened, and, and I think in many respects, what's going to come from the dispossession of the lockdowns and this global reset has very much to do with, um, you know, what we did to indigenous peoples and what has been done to people of the land um, all around the world, but particularly in the United States and pushing people out of their means of survival and into state dependency and, and then being infantilized and having their rights taken away. And that that's what we're approaching now. And But we need to understand that um, many people frame it within a patriotic context as a patriot and I would say my frame is to look at it within the lens of what was this nation built on it was actually built on how we treated indigenous people who were very pe people of spirit and the land and um, so you know I just I add like to add some extra layers in there for people to really think think through with a little more complexity about what's happening and I really encourage people to look at John Trudell's amazing body of work is that TR I think he was a prophetic voice for our time okay John Trudell T-R-U-D-E-L-L -L? yeah that's the uh, correct, yeah. South no uh, South Dakota native correct uh, 
Yeah, I believe he was born in Nebraska, but yeah. Okay. Okay. He was a, a leader in the American Indian movement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. John Trudell. Yeah. He just he just died. Just yeah, he has a lot of talks online. Yeah. 2015. 2015. 2015. Yeah, he just died a few not that many years ago. So I think we're getting down to the last few minutes of this hour, Allison, and I want to just remind people again if you want to look up Allison or see what kind of research she's been doing. Um, I, I say that with a smile because I'm like, wow, you know, talk about going into rabbit holes. I can see where you went in and stayed and kept looking, and I appreciate your your efforts. Uh, wrenchinthegears.com is where you can reach out to Allison or connect with her if you're interested. Um, yeah. The last few minutes, do, do we have a three minutes? Do we have uh, some hope for the natural human, for the spirit, for the soul? To to Is there a place for somebody like myself who who loves this life of, of nature and connection and uh, really has resisted electronics and the and that uh, that world of advanced technology uh, most of my life and I would sometimes say what did I do that for there was a lot of money in that there was a lot of opportunity <laughs> and and other it's times I'm like thank literally. God I didn't go in there and we raised our children that way. And, um, and a social education. And a social, yeah, really outdoor experience education. And so what do we got? We got two and a half hours and 45 minutes I mean, to I save us. Two minutes. <laughs> not two minutes. trying so hard to pin us down if we were not incredibly powerful, mm. right? I think they would not be trying to suck up our life force onto blockchain digital identities if we did not have tremendous power. Wow. Them, right? I think we are tremendously powerful, and they don't want us to know that. And I think many people feel very discouraged, and they don't feel powerful. But we need to own that power. And I would say those of us who are in this moment, many of us, none of us got to you know, request when to be born, right? Mm -hmm. But we are in this really life-changing moment. I mean, this world-changing, this is a transformative moment. And for those of us who see the world a different way and want to fight for the right to live in the world a different way, like, this is a tremendous opportunity to live your values, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what else could you ask than to actually have an opportunity to do something meaningful, right? And not just about you, but about all of humanity. That's a pretty incredible gift if we step into it, right? And if we're willing to, um, you know, break free out of the labels and, and to, to, you know, I think that's what, what really John Trudell's gift to me is understanding if the world is, is this amazing cosmic dance, if we are our spirits having a human experience, right? Mm -hmm. That like we do our best game. We show up and we, we live our, our truth with the time we have. And, you know, I can say this as someone who's in my 50s, and I'm willing to, like, I don't want to live in the world that they're building. So I'm willing to, like, you know, within, I'm just saying, you know, the spectrum of contesting this narrative, do my thing, right? And if, mm -hmm. if, if the time I have is less than the other time, well, then that's the choice I make, right? But I think we are powerful, and I think there are many alliances out there and many gifts um, that are out there waiting for us if we just step up. And, and I was actually, I gathered with some folks um, a couple weekends ago in Albany. They were resisting the Cuomo's vaccine um, mandate, proposed vaccine mandate. The state bar was supporting that. And, you know, we were talking about this, and someone brought up the, the Grimm's brother, the Briar Rose fairy tale with, you know, the, the princess trapped in the castle and the briars all around and everyone was being cut to ribbons trying to hack their way through. And, and the prince that made it, you know, he stood up and they said, don't, you know, don't try it, everybody dies. And he, he said, I, I'm not afraid. He said, I'm not afraid. And then, and then, the, and then, the, and then the, the hedge just parted and he could mm, walk through. That's beautiful. And I'm not trying to be good, but I'm like, we're not that's going to out weapon DARPA or out stand at Goldman Sachs, but we have powerful spirit. I think so. I thank agree you. with you. And thank you so much for all the work you've done and all the the energy you put into it. We are going to save the natural human. Yes, we are. Next up, we have Paul Fairchild with the train and the nearly noon news.